Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope everyone is enjoying their lunch. Um, I would li like to now take this opportunity to present our keynote speaker for our symposium, Candice Cerisi, who is the ex-general counsel of Stratasys. She has served for over 15 years as international and domestic in-house counsel with additional roles including corporate co compliance officer, export compliance officer, and data security officer for both public publicly and privately traded companies. She has worked in the manufacturing, advanced medical technology, and other highly regulated industries. She has served on various boards of directors, including the Corporate Council Section of the Minnesota State Bar and the Dakota Electric Association. She's a decorated Gulf War veteran who worked as a mechanic while in theater and has extensive experience in commercial transactions and streamlining related processes to allow the businesses to work faster while simultaneously mitigating risk. She has proven success in creating workable and sustainable infrastructure in rapidly growing organizations. Candace earned her JD from Hamlin Law School with a focus in corporate law shortly after earning her master's in business administration. She also possesses several undergraduate degrees in a variety of fields, including psychology, sociology, and aerospace ground equipment, mechanics and electronics. Now please welcome um, Candice Cerisi as our keynote speaker. Thank you. Easy enough. And then you can also use this one. Thank you. I like me better on paper. I, uh, that was great. I'm pretty excited to be here. I even like how sitting here we've captured the attention of the person in the painting. Compliance officer, export compliance officer, and data security officer for both publicly and privately traded companies. She has worked in the manufacturing, advanced medical technology, and other highly regulated industries. She has served on various boards of directors, including the Corporate Council Section of the Minnesota State Bar and the Dakota Electric Association. She's a decorated Gulf War veteran who worked as a mechanic while in theater and has extensive experience in commercial transactions and streamlining related processes to allow the businesses to work faster while simultaneously mitigating risk. She has proven success in creating workable and sustainable infrastructure in rapidly growing organizations. Candace earned her JD from Hamlin Law School with a focus in corporate law shortly after earning her master's in business administration. She also possesses several undergraduate degrees in a variety of fields, including psychology, sociology, and aerospace ground equipment. Now please welcome Anda Cerisi as our keynote speaker. Thank you. Easy enough. And then you can also use this one. Thank you. Okay. I like me better on paper. I, uh, that was great. I'm pretty excited to be here. I even like how sitting here we've captured the attention of the person in the painting. Uh, it's almost as if he's paying attention. I, I like that. So I think you guys are falling asleep. I'm just going to go that way with it. Um, I will warn you, I've had a lot of caffeine today, so I do act a little bit like a chihuahua on crack. That is why. Um, to, I named this presentation 3 de novo. For the law students here, you understand that de novo uh, means to look at this new, not necessarily with deference to a lower court or other decisions. Um, it also has some scientific implications, including the replication of DNA. That does come into play here a little bit, especially when we start speaking to some of the uses of 3D printing. Um, I am going to say that I'm different from some of the other speakers in that uh, most everybody here is an expert in something. I am not. I like to consider in-house counsel as the family practitioner of lawyers. We know enough to know when you need to go see the experts. Uh, kind of a little bit like ADD, you know, one moment you're doing employment law and then you're like, oh, product liability, oh, hey, labeling, oh, environmental issues. So there's a lot of things that come into play as an in-house counsel where you get to see the forest. Um, and most of the speakers you've heard today can identify every tree and how to plant those trees and tend to those trees and help those trees grow. I can tell you which kind of tree it is and which expert you need to call. 
So again, my presentation is slightly different in that it is coming from the in-house counsel viewpoint and less from the experts in a particular niched area. I put this up here because with 3D printing and, and anybody's fingertips, we have now released the ability to unleash the imagination. And I know this sounds very hyperbolic, and I know this sounds very extreme, but if you were here for the earlier presentation talking about the capabilities with the bio and the mechanical and some of the electronics and the integration with humans, you can see that the potential with 3D printing is nothing short of astounding. And we're going to talk about some of the potentials some of the risks and some of the ethical concerns that are actually underlying these. So for those lawyers here, you will get some ethics credits. So we'll, I'll talk slowly on that part, so then you can try to get more if you need to. If we go back historically, if you needed a tool, a, a specialized product or something along those lines, you went to the expert. You went to the craftsman. You went to the carpenter, to the blacksmith, to the tradesman, and you said, hey, I need a sword, I need a shield, I need something, can you please make it for me? And they would. And whatever you wanted, you pretty much kind of gave them general guidelines. I'm looking for this, can you make it? But ultimately, the end product rested with the expert. They gave you what you needed. The problem with this type of, um, I hate to use the word manufacturing, creation of products is there was obviously little quality control. And the quality control that you did have was often sort of in the field. You found out your sword was defective in the middle of a castle siege, and uh, my bad. Um, you really don't have a lot of recourse at that point. So product quality and integrity, not so much an issue at this point. They were a little bit more concerned at this time with sailing out the end of the earth or <coughs> plagues or bloodlettings, things along those lines. So right at this point, not a lot of quality controls, not a lot of oversight. Fast forward to the Industrial Revolution. Now, fact, uh, people were able to make products in mass production in single locations. This is huge for many reasons. One, uh, the knowledge is no longer resting with one expert. It's no longer the blacksmith who can tell you everything that needs to be known into making the product. Now knowledge is distributed amongst the factory. Now you have several people who are smart in certain areas of the production line. This set the stage for traditional manufacturing and what we now know of today, which allows for the mass production um, started more around the Ford era, uh, which comes and allows people to do a, achieve an economy of scale. That economy of scale allowing for cheaper products, consistent outputs, uh, and some mechanism to have a quality standard. Some mechanism to randomly audit produced parts against whatever that objective standard was to ensure that that consistency is being met and that standards are being achieved. Now keep in mind, most manufacturing is subtract subtractive. You take a big block of something and you either use some sort of milling or boring or tapping or dyeing. You're doing something to take away from a particular substance to achieve an end result. Um, ultimately, you can think of it as taking a block of marble and making this. Um, you're, you're taking something, you're removing something, and you're unleashing the beast within. So ultimately, that is subtractive manufacturing, and that is how traditional manufacturing tends to focus on. Now we're going to go into additive manufacturing. Now, there are several ways to 3D print. It is not just this way. There are other ways to do it, but for sake of time, and because I don't see enough caffeine here, we're going to stick with this one. Um, and this, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you a story first. I'm going to digress. A long time ago, I bought a house, and we decided to let the children pick the colors of the dining room. As an advice, don't ever do that. Um, our dining room went from sort of an Easter egg blue to seaweed green. We were constantly repainting that dining room. And my husband endearingly told me one day, do you realize that the area of our dining room is actually decreasing because we have put on so many layers of paint in this room? And ultimately, that's what added. That's what this is. This is. Imagine, if you will, taking uh, it's a, a, a Hewlett Packard print, inkjet. You're printing, but instead of using ink, we're going to use caulk. So you're using caulk. You can imagine how fluffy that would be. How much thicker it would be. And if you continually repeat the process of printing a word, you eventually end up with something three-dimensional. But now let's say I want something three-dimensional, but I want there to be an ability for something to move. I want there to be functionality. 
within this one block. I don't want that cast marble statue um, or the other one that we saw. Um, I want something a little bit more usable. Well, they actually have water soluble materials too. So you can do a hard layer, stop, water soluble, stop, hard layer, stop, water soluble, stop, and you can go along those lines. And then when your product is completed, you give it a nice bath and you take it out of the bath and the water soluble stuff goes away. The result is you've now presented something that looks like this. Now, if you notice, if I turn one of these gears, every gear on this particular device moves with it. This was printed in one shot. This is a one piece uh, wonder, uh, one hit wonder, whatever. Um, but you can imagine from a subtractive manufacturing how complicated something like this would be to produce. Ultimately, it would require such costs that it would be cost prohibitive. If this was a prototype for a company, a prototype like this would be so expensive. And if you messed up, repeats would be very, very cost prohibitive. Let me set this here. So ultimately, by using water soluble materials, you're able to achieve that effect. You're able to achieve motion and movement in one printing. You don't need to go back, you don't need to add, you don't need to fix. So when you look at traditional manufacturing compared to 3D manufacturing, a couple of major differences, um, less waste. When I talked about having a piece of, you can imagine the statue, how much marble was left over when the statue was done. Well, if you're using something like titanium, um, there would be leftover titanium. When you're doing additive manufacturing, that just sort of happens. There's stuff that is wasteful that you're losing. Um, but 3D printing, you have less waste. I mean, granted, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, you're using exactly what you need. You're not using anything more than that. So you have less waste. You have a shorter supply chain management issue. You're not having to get parts from this person and this person and this person and this person. You get your material. You have your printer done. And, it, and there's some other nuances. But for the most part, that's the basic approach. Lower cost, again, materials. You have to have the materials. You have to have your printer. Um, whereas traditional manufacturing, you need to have larger capital equipment. You need to have tools and dies. And it also um, has more flexibility with uh, 3D manufacturing. Um, there are environmental concerns from traditional manufacturing, and you do have more waste. More waste means more control. I don't want to be um, misleading. There is waste with 3D printing. Uh, it's just the nature of the material that you use that will determine the amount of risk that you have with your environmental exposure. But the number one difference between traditional manufacturing and 3D manufacturing, aside from all the other benefits mission, uh, mentioned, is customization. If you want to customize something from a traditional manufacturing perspective, you're looking at customizations relying on something like taking sub-assemblies and then configuring them in different arrays. So if you want, I want a customized widget, it's not like I can create from subtractive manufacturing a customized widget. I have to take various pieces and go, would you like them like this? Would you like them like this? And it's really more of that sort of uh, um, scenario where 3D printing allows for customization on the front end for lower cost. You want to change something, all I do is change the file uh, downstream. So that is how easy 3D printing uh, allows for manufacturing or production of products, proactively allows you to make changes, customizations, and whatever you need. There are two primary paths to uh, 3D printing. One, you buy a printer and you print. The second path you can do is you can outsource. You can say, you know, I need 15 widgets to this particular drawing, and you can find a company who will print those for you. And we'll talk about the benefits and risks and the wonderful things associated with that shortly. Um, but for the purposes of this discussion and the disruption associated, I haven't been drinking, I swear. Um, maybe I should have been. I don't know. The disruptions associated with 3D printing. There are three major things to focus on. You have to have three things. You have to have a CAD drawing. You must have a drawing. You must have material. And you must have a printer. So those are the three things you must have. And each one of those elements presents a risk to the company and to the end user. So it's very important to remember that you have those three elements. Each one independently has its own risk. And overlying all three of those items is, in fact, the usage of the device itself. That is another risk that is independent. So 3D printing is infiltrating every major industry. I think we're all aware that it's in the clothing industry. And aside from a stark departure from modesty, 
Some of the bigger concerns you might see in the 3D printing area are potentially IP issues, uh, chafing, um, itching, <laughs> likelihood of confusion with Lady Gaga, and my favorite, for those women who find that underwire is not uncomfortable enough, you can have a whole bra made out of just underwire. Uh, so you can see where 3D printing has revolutionized clothing. Now, I'm not going to get into the IP issues associated with this for two reasons. One, you just heard a whole panel on IP, and I try not to beat horses that are dead. Um, but also because we'll be talking about IP later anyway, so, so it's coming up anyways. You're not being saved from that. I guess you could actually have with some of those designs intentional infliction of emotional distress, but that's only for the tort lawyers that are in here. 3D printing of food. 3D printing of food is an interesting phenomenon, and I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about simulated copies of 3D of food. I'm talking about the actual printing of food. I want to point out one critical factor. The 3D printing of food is a first world problem, not a third world solution. A lot of people hear about the 3D printing of food, and they think that you're actually creating food out of chemicals. You know, you're making something edible where otherwise it's not. Not the case. Um, you're actually using a material that is food based. So you're looking at taking food and making it look pretty. And a good way to think of it is imagine, if you will, your mashed potatoes presented to you in the shape of an Eiffel Tower. How cool is that? Or you could have your dessert come to you in a scaled down model of the solar system. And I don't know why I said scaled down, because if it was actual size, you would need it. Um, so you can imagine where presentation is key here. And for 3D printing of food, that's what we're looking at. Now there is the potential and there are people who are exploring futuristic opportunities in creating edible foods from chemical compounds, thereby creating a third world solution. Something that you might see out of the Jetsons, but I'm looking around here right now, and I think a lot of you are too young to know who the Jetsons are, so I think I'm dating myself. <laughs> so for those of you who might not know who these people are, humor me, and uh, they are a futuristic family from the past who could, at a whim, push a button and voila, have any piping hot meal that they wanted. And I so wish they had that option available, but it's not there, but people are looking at that. So when we're, now we're talking about food, you're thinking of consuming things, this is where we're starting to get into one of the critical elements that we spoke about, material. If I serve you something that does look like the Eiffel Tower out of a bad potato-based material, it might taste nasty. Look cool, taste nasty. But now if I serve you something with a bad mayonnaise-based material, you can see where now we're going to start having effects. We're going to have people that get sick. Now you're going to have issues because now people are ingesting it. So this brings us to the next point. Material is material. Material is critical. Material is everything. Not all material is designed the same. Not all material can be used across the board. You can print with almost anything that you could possibly imagine right now. So I know earlier they were talking about 3D printing with plastics. Um, that is an option, but that's not your only option. It's not just hard plastics. There's other things you can print as well. Um, I am going to show you a couple of examples of things you can print, although I confess they're actually plastics. Um, <laughs> one of them, this is interesting, it's actually a two-dimensional picture. And you might notice it's a two-dimensional picture. But if you hold it up to the light, I don't know if it's working because it doesn't look right unless there's a light behind it, um, it's actually a photograph. Um, it looks better with a bright light because then it comes across clear as a regular photograph. Now if you were to look at it flat or in any other with a dark light behind it, it just looks like nonsense. But this is actually a 3D printing of a two-dimensional object. So it's pretty, it's a far more robust. Does it work? No, it doesn't work. I need a light behind it. Oh, wait. Nope, you're just going to have to play with, oh, yeah, you have to just trust me. Um, or I can get a phone. Or... Right. Okay, if you get it, hold it up to the light. You'll see how it looks that way. That's one thing that you can print. You can also print knick-knacky things, like a phone case that's interactive. So if you want to play with your phone case because phones aren't obnoxious enough and you want to make sure everybody knows you're using your phone, you can do something like this. So, so this is another thing. So you can three. Now this is hard plastic, though. This is what a lot of general end user consumers might print with, but that's not everything. It's far more 
robust than that. But now if you have a 3D printer at home and you start printing stuff, here's where one of the risks comes from. How do you know that the material that you're purchasing is safe for the use intended? For instance, if you print up with some standard printing material and you make a lovely tea set, is there a problem? You might not think so. You're like, oh, isn't this fun? However, there's different materials. One material, for instance, PLA, is a safe, believed to be safe, um, for food contact. It's made of what my hippie friends call dinner, what I call compost, but it's made of renewable resources. It's safe material and it's something that you can use and put in contact with food. However, if you were to print the same tea set with ABS, which is a petroleum-based material, you're going to have problems. Now, if I am an end user and I decide to print up this tea set, and I'm like, yeah, I have a tea set. Do I know that I cannot use that tea set in conjunction with food or with liquids? And do I have some duty if I printed it up and I go to my friend and I go, Jamie, I made you a tea set. Don't let it come in contact with liquids or food or children, or small animals, or dishwashers, or microwaves, because based on what I printed, you're going to assume that food is safe. So you can see where now we're going to start coming into a problem here, where does the end user know of the capabilities of the material that, which they're producing and how that can apply? So labeling. Labeling is important. Not only the labeling for the manufacturer or the, the manufacturers of the materials themselves, are the manufacturers putting on the proper labels, please do not use this material for the following items, but are those labels conveyed in such a way that the end user understands them? It needs to be very clear, especially if you're looking at transporting something that you've printed um, to another particular jurisdiction. If I wanted to print up that tea set, for instance, and I used a specific material, and I decide to ship it across state lines, or country lines for that matter, and I want to go to, say, California, which by definition could be its own country at this point. Um, any lawyer here would agree with that 100%. Um, so California, I decide to ship my crazy printed tea set to California. California has heavy regulations on how things must be labeled. Now, if I'm just sending it to my friend Bob, that's one thing. But if I'm sending that for any type of commercial application, maybe I decide to start making business in my printed tea sets, um, then I'm going to have issues. And, you know, there's Prop 65 in California. They have so many fun, crazy laws that keep lawyers employed forever, um, which is good, I guess, because they don't have accredited law schools there. Those lawyers need to do something. Um, but it's important to remember, just because you're printing stuff up, these fundamental issues, such as labeling and shipping, don't go away. Uh, they're, they're critical, and they have to be attended to. And in addition to that, there's the environmental concerns. The Environmental Protection Agency is very anal and how they deal with um, the shipping, the transportation, the packaging, and the label of goods that might harm the environment. Given all the uses that you can make with some of these 3D printers, some of these materials are not something you should be playing with. They're not something that you can just say, oh, I'm out, I'm going to throw the container away. It doesn't work. The end user needs to understand what material they have and how to handle the waste accordingly, and that includes whether the end user happens to be an individual or a company. They, oh, I do want to say safety, too. To the extent that these things aren't safe, you need to make sure that you yourself or your employees are properly protected from any exposure that they might have. So material manufacturers, we talked about the material. Material is everything. And, it, and you know, seriously, metals, plastics, rubbery, whatever you want, cells, you can print in anything. So think about the material. And now we're going to take it over to designs. You can download designs for billions of different things. So if you go to Thingiverse, you will find hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of designs to 3D print anything you could possibly want. Now, if you, however, want to be more creative than that, you can. You can go to certain sites and uh, print up maybe, say I want to design a new bicycle. I can grab pre-existing CAD drawings for tires, pre-existing CAD drawings for gears, and then I can configure my own crazy bicycle. Um, and that sounds fun. That sounds awesome. However, what happens when I download these designs, maybe I decide I'm going to design a stool, and I design a stool, and I sit on the stool, and the stool breaks. Arguably, I've only hurt myself. But what if I design a stool off somebody else's design? I've downloaded a design. I built the stool. I sit on it. No, I don't sit on it because that, that's bad. 
Uh, okay, let's see. I sat on it. Clearly, I'm eating solar system sized desserts, and it breaks. Uh, now, what do I do? Now, I'm no longer the. I didn't design it. There is clearly a design defect. What happens then? Uh, or let's make it even worse, or different. Um, I three. I collect old cars and anti antiquated cars, and I decide that I need to 3D print some things that I have a hard time finding spare parts for, like the knobs for my eight track player. I print up some new ones. Yeah, there's like two people that know what an 8-track player is in here. Thank you. Thanks for that. If you could explain to the person to your right what one of those is, that will be awesome. Um, maybe I need a new authentic gear shift cover. I can 3D print one of those. But what if I need a new throttle valve for the carburetor? Uh, you know, it's really hard to find carburetors for some of these classic cars, so it's not like I can just get an extra part. So I 3D print it. And I'm driving on the freeway with my 3D printed carburetor throttle valve, and it breaks. And I'm going 50, no, I'm never going 55. I'm going 70 and uh, ish. And, uh, and, my, and it breaks. And then there, now my car's on fire. And I'm behind a fuel tanker. I don't know. You can imagine where things could go wrong really fast, really quickly. Um, so it's important to understand that you're now downloading designs, you're building stuff, and you are not necessarily involved in the design process. There is nothing suggesting that you understand what is required for those parts. Bike helmets, what would happen if somebody 3D printed a bike helmet? Is the material designed to handle protection of the head? Is the design safe to protect the protection of the head? From a consumer perspective, this is a huge question because there are three primary printers. There's a consumer, there's a company that prints on their own, and there's a company that outsources their printing. So are your three major focuses and your consumer according to the Consumer Protection Act of 1976, lacks capacity and competency to tell what is safe. So if the consumers don't know what is safe and they're out there printing up stuff and doing God knows what with it, I mean, I, wouldn't, I mean, that's cool that he did a 3D printed motorcycle, super awesome, but I'm not sure I would trust myself riding at it at the 70-ish speed. So you can see where this would present implications or concerns, if nothing else. So there are some two fields of thought on this. How do we control what the consumers are getting? How do we make sure that people aren't out there creating dangerous things for the environment? The, the two schools of thought are actually polarized, as you would expect um, for them to be. One school of thought is sort of this Darwinian, it all play out survival of the fittest. Much like Amazon.com has this rating system for buyers and rating system for sellers, you can say, oh, this guy's got a 98% approval rate. He must be good. That eventually the industry will catch up and some sort of rating system will be applied so you can say, wow, this guy on his designs has a 4% rating. He sucks. I'll pick somebody else's design. They, they, there's this concept that eventually the industry will begin to recognize who's a bad designer and who's a good designer. And they do recognize that the way to determine a bad designer is because bad designs are noted, like somebody has their sword break off in the middle of a castle siege. Kind of that sort of scenarios. And you can imagine the risks there. The polar opposite is government regulation. Strict control. The government will regulate the designs that are on the internet. The government will regulate the usage of any products. And I think we all know how successful the government has been on those items to date. Not going to happen. So there are some other concepts saying, well, maybe if somebody has designed something that they can put on the necessary certifications. They can state that this is certified according to the Society of Mechanical Engineers or the Industry of Electrical and Electronic Engineers or my favorite called the Scooby Scream. I don't know, I like to read the acronyms, but IE is a really tough one to go with. I gotta figure out where I am. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, okay, we talked about the schools of thought. One way that they are talking about regulating this, and I mentioned the government regulation on the internet, not very successful. Um, I tried to come up with a good analogy at regulation, regulating information on the internet. My son said it was the equivalent of uh, finding a lawyer with a heart, and I was like, well, it's not that bad. <laughs> so, so we came up with a different one, and that was threading a needle with a lasagna noodle. Um, so that is proving futile. But one thing that they can do is to take the regulations and implement them at the sort of a funneled approach at the printer. Many of you might have tried to copy maybe a Xerox of a photograph and receive some error messages as a copyrighted photo um, to at least alert the person who is printing up the device 
to some notice that you're printing up a design that is not approved by any you know, known standard, or you are printing up something that is copyrighted. So there is talk about inserting regulations at the printer level, so the software and the printers will now be fitted with some sort of control to prevent people from printing bad things. This would do two things. One, help minimize the number of um, bad defects. It would also show intent. If you get a notice saying this is copyright protected and you disregard that notice, uh, then there's a certain amount of assumption of liability on your part. Um, also, it might dissuade some um, bad people out there, although I, I don't think a lot of bad people necessarily care what the laws say, but we'll keep going. So we talked about the material. Material, material. It is so important. Um, I'm not repeating myself when I say that. Um, it is critical. What you choose to print with makes all the difference in the world. Then you have the design. Now, companies are not above design either. Companies need to be very aware that the designs they have, um, one, don't infringe on any intellectual property of other people. But when you're an engineer and you have titanium, you know everything about the properties of titanium. You know the coefficients of thermal expansion. You know the strength, the metal ratio. You know everything about it. You know all of its properties. But now you're printing with something else. Now you have this new material. The new material, while you may know all the properties of that material, how that material is printed does not necessarily result in products of identical integrity. And that's for two reasons. One, printers differ. What you print on one printer will not be the same necessarily if you print it on another printer. All printers are not created equal. This is not to suggest that printers aren't merchantable. It's just to say that printers are designed with special capacities and capabilities in mind, and they are not necessarily interchangeable. If I know all of the um, elements of any particular property and I put it on printer A, my product will have certain quantifiable characteristics. That same material on printer B may perform entirely different. So it's not just a matter of knowing the material, it's knowing how the material and the printer relate to one another. And on that note too, it's not just how they relate to one another, it's the orientation. If I were to want to print up this fat chubby little guy here, and I put him in the printer, and I want him printed up like this, he will come out a certain way, and he will have certain characteristics. However, if I upload that design drawing, so he's printing up this way, that product's not going to perform the same way. Something as simple as design, uh, uploading a drawing this way and uploading a drawing this way is going to change the dynamics of the resulting product. They are not apples to apples. So if you have an engineer who is working at your company who is trying to determine the best way to use a particular material for a particular product, you need to have significant processes and controls in place to make sure that when that drawing goes into the printer, it's not changing orientation. It has to be identical on every sense of the word. So it's a little bit more research for the company to make sure that these types of, um, yeah, that's a funny fat little guy, I don't know what to, to do with that. Um, and, and now this is just a statue. This one's not actually doing anything. If that statue were to have function like this, then the function will also change. So it's important that the engineers who are analyzing the material also understand the property, the functions of the, or the printer, and understand the properties of the printer and the orientation within, and then the design. There needs to be clear ownership of the design, and that's a bit of an intellectual property issue on one, but then there's also a non-defect issue, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Overlying all of these is how is the product going to be used? Sorry. Oh, no, we're not there yet. So one of the how it's going to be used I want to talk about is the aerospace industry and automotive industry. When we talk about my throttle valve going out on my car earlier as I'm driving down the freeway at 70-ish, um, you can see that a critical component can have dire effects. Now the automotive and the aerospace industry are both utilizing this type of technology. It's proving very helpful for them. The thing that needs to be understood here is, one, there has to be clear guidelines. Um, they're not on critical systems yet. So you can see where it would be huge in the aerospace industry. For instance, uh, a plane is down. Instead, I, having been a mechanic, the one thing I can say is one of the greatest delays in getting something back onto the flight line tends to be waiting for that one part. 
Um, sometimes it can be down for weeks or months just waiting for that one part. Or sometimes you can't even get the part. You have to order the next higher assembly. Um, so you can imagine if you're waiting for your plane, which has now been sitting there for a couple hours, you're delayed, you want to go home, and they're waiting for a part. Now sometimes those delays can, I mean the parts delays can be weeks. But if the airline industry can print up the part right there on the spot, that would be huge. I mean, the, the implications are, are drastic. I mean, they're significant. They're wonderful. You can now have a quicker turnaround time, um, improved uh, turnaround time on the recovery of the planes, on the cars. What this means to the industries is nothing short of amazing. Um, the problem is uh, that the Federal Aviation Administration and the European Safety Administration they can be a little anal retentive on the control of parts that go on these types of, of, of equipment on aircraft and cars. And fair enough, we would never want to show up at the airport and have Delta go, we just tried something new with our planes, we hope it works. Nobody would want that. You're, you kind of like that. You know, some things you really like them to be sort of thoughtful on. Um, and these two industries are very thoughtful on these fronts. What this means, though, is there is certain certification processes, anything relating to form, fit, or function has to have various approvals, and getting something through the FAA for approval is not insignificant, um, and it's not easy. So while this, the, these airline, the aerospace and the automotive industries are using 3D printing, they currently are using them, um, the potential is still coming, and, and therefore the risks associated with it are. Um, the best thing a company can do right now is, if you're a company and you're even considering being into those industries, is to proactively address these things. And how would you proactively address it? Controls. Make sure that you have controls. Documented processes for how you're handling the parts. Documented processes for finding the parts. If I print up something for an aircraft, it's very important that I have strict controls over this or something like counterfeiting could quickly come into the market and you get into the counterfeited parts or um, inferior parts hitting any particular uh, company. So establish controls proactively. So the contemporaries FAA is the FDA. Um, both of them, again, heavily regulated. The FDA has some in interesting um, things. They've recently approved uh, pharmaceuticals for 3D printing. Uh, and these are great. I mean, the thought of being able to 3D print medication is huge. And you might think, well, that's goofy. Why would you want to 3D print your, your pills? Um, there's a lot of benefits. One such benefit is it allows for better controlling of information. It allows to make the drugs more porous, so they can be better absorbed by the elderly or children. Um, and also, apparently, again, I'm not making any medical claims, any assertions. If you're from the FDA, I'm nothing I'm saying. Allegedly, talk to your attorney, everything like that. Please, that applies. Um, allegedly, the shape of the tablet actually impacts the dosing as well. So if you were to take a pill that's pyramidal, pyramidal, pyramid-shaped um, versus one that's uh, round, the way that it is released into your body is different, and it actually helps patients better. So 3D printing of medicine is huge in, uh, for, for many, many reasons. And you can't see this, but I'm not talking about some of the other medical benefits. 3D printed casts, um, and this is a really cool cast up here. It's mind-boggling. I'm just going to make this up now because I can. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what would be shown right here right now if only you could see it. Oh, but i got to keep going. So 3D printed cast, this one's interesting that you can't see right now because it is, it's like a web and it, uh, and you don't have, I don't know if you guys remember the old days of the plaster ones where you had to like take pens and stuff and throw it down into your body and when you finally got your cast off you just had ink marks everywhere and pencil marks and this one you can actually like scratch your arm because of the web noting of the, the cast. Um, 3D printed eyeballs. Um, if you needed a prosthetic eye, instead of going, well this, I kind of looks like your eye and doing one of those sure this will work for you you can actually take a 3d image of your eye and get an exact replica of your eye it's huge so then it, you can imagine how much nicer this would be from a confidence perspective anyways um, 3d printed uh, um, prosthetics this one's huge I actually have a friend that has a child that lost a limb at around seven or eight years old the average prosthetic takes somewhere between, or costs five figures, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. You can imagine how expensive that is when you have a child who is growing. To try to keep up with the prosthetics gets very difficult. Um, however, you can 3D print a prosthetic for a fraction of the cost. That's amazing and is certainly helpful for children who now can actually have their prosthetics grow with them. 
Um, there's a company called Limitless out there right now that does prosthetics for children that has licensed with Disney, Marvel Comics, and, and all these other um, famous entities. And what it does is they have licensing rights. So if you want a 3D printed arm that looks like Wolverine, you can get one. And imagine how cool that would be if you're a boy with no arm, but now you've got Wolverine or Iron Man right there. I mean, it's amazing what these kids can now have at their fingertips, literally. Um, Another one is, uh, okay, Vital Images is a company that can take 3D images right now of the inside of your body. And they can look at those 3D images and they can have those converted into an actual um, model. So if you're a surgeon and you have to look at a double aortic arch, again, I have pictures that you guys can't see, you might look at the picture and you might turn the picture and you might work with the picture and it might get difficult, but if you can 3D print a double aortic arch, which is identical. It, this is from the patient. You can now look at this item, and by the way, it is rubbery, so it's, it's not that hard plastic that we were talking about earlier. Um, now you can see, you're actually taking what's inside of the body and you're bringing it out. Um, I'll pass this around so you can play with somebody's double aortic arch. Um, the other thing you can do, imagine you have to work on the heart of a child, but the 3D image is hard to look at. Look, you can 3D print it, and you can totally just look at it and work with it. And I'm not making any medical claims here at all, because I don't know what the FDA regulation is on right this. I don't know if it's 510K or whatever. So I'm just saying how amazing is this? They took the inside of the body, and they're giving you it on the outside in a non-invasive mechanism. That's impressive. It's even colored appropriately. Now let's flip that. So Precision, ADM, also has abilities, but their abilities are taking the outside and bringing it on the inside. You need a hip cup, you need some, some sort of joint replacement, we can just pick one off the shelf in the traditional model, or you can have one 3D printed to fit exactly. So Precision has managed to take something from the outside that needs to go in the inside that is unique to the particular patient. This is, this is specific to you, and you can imagine the improved mobility, recovery. Again, no FDA claims being made here. Hip stems, hip implants. These things are all special to the patient. These aren't off the shelf. These aren't putting square pegs into round holes. These are special for you. I think more are coming this way. Now, this is where it's going to get a little interesting. So you ever see, uh, well, most people, the, the 3D printing of bones is not uncommon. People do 3D print bones. This is something that happens um, in various countries throughout the world. And the University of Australia has been leading that, um, as far as I know. Uh, and one of the things that the 3D printing of a bone does is if you have a, a head injury where part of your bone is missing, traditionally, they would actually have to cut your skull and then replace it with what they had on the shelf to kind of line up together. Now, you can just 3D print the skull replacement and that replacement will be an exact fit. There's none of this trying to guess work, none of this cutting more away. Um, you now have something specifically to fit your head. And potentially you could um, have replacements for the entire body. Um, in China, the University of China recently invented a biomaterial in which they 3D printed a working kidney that lasted for four months. Um, and earlier in 2013, a two-year-old received a 3D printed windpipe based on her own stem cells. And that's where we get interested, where this is starting to go into new world, new territory. You could potentially print 3D replacements for the entire body. And what does that mean? Now, earlier today, you heard a gentleman speaking about the ability to, com the research that's going into combining electronics into the bio field to put electronic capabilities within the human body. They talked about the current ability to implant in an ear so you can hear conversations that nobody else can hear. Now on the good side, for the deaf person who can now talk on the phone and nobody else can hear the conversation, that's cool. If you're working for the Secret Service Agency and you now have the ability to, without one of those NCIS devices, you know, that they always seem to have and nobody seems it's odd that they're walking around talking to themselves, um, you can now have those implanted. Think of the potential from a misuse perspective. Now, there are enough, there, now, we are coming up with some great research on great materials. I was talking to a guy that was involved in the cloning of rats, and I was like, great, because we need more rats. That's awesome. Um, I, I'm not sure where that went. But, so it's amazing the capability we have. Back in 1942, the Nazis underwent various trials, because they're like, oh, hey, let's see what this does. 
Um, and there were so many trials going on to see what does A, what happens if A and B mix, or A and Z and X and Y, and let's merge those together. But there was no thought as to why these tri trials were being conducted. Now, we are coming up with some amazing ideas, and amaz amazing, but there's no current boundaries on how far we can push this limit. If we can mix electronics and the biology together to where we can actually combine electronic capabilities with 3D printing into a human, where does that take us from an ethical perspective? So it's just something to keep in mind. The ability to 3D print an organ also could run afoul of maybe the ability to commoditize organs. Right now there's rules in place to prevent people from commoditizing organs um, so that the rich are not unjustly rewarded. In this case, if you can 3D print them, maybe the rich will have more accessibility to medical care than the poor. But now here's just an interesting question, and I know I'm running uh, kind of short on time, so I'm going to try to be quick about this. Does anybody here know what a bioprinter would cost if you wanted to print something using cells? Okay, anybody want to guess? Yes? They're anywhere from $5,000 to $320,000. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're done. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So think about it. A bioprinter. You can print. So a reliable bioprinter on average is 188,000. So imagine. Okay, maybe maybe you're not the average person, or maybe you do need medical treatment. If you're desperate, if you get to the stage of life where you're like, I want a cure, you could actually go out there and do some of these crazy university research on your own. What is to stop the end customer from getting creative? Not that creativity is a bad thing but that maybe we need to set the rules up ahead of time before we release this out for anybody. Because what you wouldn't want is somebody coming up going, I have a great idea for your kidney. I got a new one. I can give it to you tomorrow. You need to have some constraints on how this is applied. Uh, and then I don't want to mention, ever mention medical and not mention uh, personal health, identifiable information, personal health information. To the extent that these printers are able to do anything with bio, we need to make sure that any personal health information is redacted. Some restrictions may apply. <laughs> I couldn't come here and not talk about the use of weapons. Um, obviously, this is uh, one of the forerunners of the concerns of 3D printing, the ghost gun. Um, the ghost guns, Cody Wilson was the one forerunner in this. You probably heard of him. He decided to market and sell. Selling guns without a license is, in fact, a federal offense. However, if you were to 3D or Google uh, 3D printed guns, you will find the ability to find 3D printed guns. Um, you can also find 3D printed helmets, 3D printed flak vests, 3D, no, and, but I do want to say that if you're buying a 3D printed flak vest off the internet, the gene pool is self-chlorinating. I don't know what to say on that one. <laughs> you're on your own on that one. <laughs> but, so you can imagine, they recently in February of this year, they released a weapon, a semi-automatic weapon, 95% 3D printed, um, which could fire 18 rounds uh, before it had any side effects. So 3D printing a weapon is real. Um, these are some more pictures. I didn't put those comments on there. The only thing I could find that was license, licensable. Um, you can 3D print bullets. You can do ballistics. You can do missiles. Um, so gun control. Now you may have your opinion, and if you think about yourself, whether or not can we release 3D printed guns? Can we? Should we allow them? Yes, we we all understand the Second Amendment, right? We all have the right to to make weapons for our personal use with some restrictions. Um, you do not have right to make weapons and sell them on the open market. Um, and then you have to com compare that or contrast that against personal safety. If I can print up a gun and get it on the airport without any security noticing, that's a problem. Um, but I do want to bring up one comment too. We talked earlier about the ability to put bio into materials. That biological and chemical introduction into chemical uh, into materials includes biological weapons. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a kidney cell that you're putting into any material. It could very well be anthrax, and it could be a slow eluding anthrax. There is the ability for bi biological, chemical, and nuclear introduction into the materials of these devices. And that's where the gun control definitely needs to come into play. I'm not going to beat the IP horse to death. We all are aware of what some of these issues are. You can 3D print any of these things and more. And I highly recommend that if you do do a search on Google, you look up things like the Clinton-Trump high heels. Those are funny. Um, you can find the Trump tampon disposal or the um, Clinton uh, nutcracker. You can get all these things. They're hysterical. I'm not playing politics here. You can find it across the board. Piracy, obviously an issue. Third party production. This is huge. This is where a lot of the issues are going to come down because ultimately, if I give you my designs and I say print this for me, 
Who is the manufacturer? And that is where the law is vague. So if you are having third-party production on the beautiful side, if you've got a great idea and you want to get this taken care of, you can print it and you can send it to another company and say, do this for me. And you have now inserted a huge, ambiguous wall and who is responsible for that end product. In this case, it is critical that any company maintain very good contract negotiations to the extent that could be in some countries, the manufacturer, the one that developed the product, is ultimately responsible, period. You will not escape liability. So to the extent that you're getting someone else to do the work, a company is really offloading a lot of liability. So contracts are critical. I swear I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm getting faster. Um, these are the issues. I know that you've heard about the IP and you're going to be hearing about product liability, but there's other things as well. ITAR, to the extent that you're building anything, you can, get, you can download anything. You can get guns. You can get F-18 components. You can get everything off the Internet that does not make it legal to print. There are laws that prohibit that. Um, the defect of the printer, merchantability of it, and data privacy and data security from a material you have defect safeties. Warnings and the environmental concerns, the manufacturing, the IP, the warning, the compliance. You need to make sure that your printer and your material are actually compatible for the intended use, that manufacturing and materials have the proper certification. Is it FAA? Does it require FAA certification or FDA certification? Uh, or any other certification for that matter, CE, UL, whatever you need. Uh, pick a letter, um, make sure it's got that, and consistency. Again, we get into the orientation. You need to make sure that you're being consistent in how you are printing up these items. Um, and ultimately, I'm going to end with companies need to be proactive. And this just to prevent bad law from the legislature. Bad laws or bad facts make for bad laws. And right now, there's very little guidance on this, which means one bad incident is going to re result in an res uh, emotional response from the government. You don't want to get into the emotional reactive, oh my goodness, how are we going to have to do this? I play hockey, and the one thing I know is you do not learn the rules of the game during the game. You don't develop skills during the game. You do that ahead of time, and if they can set forth clear boundaries and if companies can be proactive in their boundaries, and you get this outlined up front, the companies are going to be more successful, universities are going to be more successful, and the government will not have to initiate some reactive type of control. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candace. Um, we are running a little bit behind, Sorry. but... No, but um, I know people have questions, so oh. would it be okay oh, yeah. sure, for sure. us to have about 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll take a short break and go into our second and last panel. Thank you. And Daryl also agreed, where'd Daryl go? He also agreed to answer any question you might have. I volunteered him too. Thanks, Daryl, appreciate that. The yes? I just want to know the dynamics of the scale of the industry. Is, as you emphasize on the importance of the material, is that material manufactured by independent manufacturers, or is like they have cooperation with the printer manufacturers? How is the dynamic between the, like, the different parts of the industry? Great question. And actually, my answer is both. Uh, so one, there are material manufacturers out there. You can buy material from various sources, um, and you need to be very sure that what you're buying is what you need, um, or what your third-party company is printing for you, is make sure they're using the right material. But then as you saw with the university research, they also have their own material that they're, they're using, um, and in some cases, they're enhancing it. That does raise concerns from maybe an FDA concern, and I'm certain the university is, is attending to those because the university's lawyers are not something that they're shy of. But to make sure that the materials that they are using or developing on their own, that is something that they need to be able to handle the, um, the qualities of, to make sure that those material safety data sheets, or safety data sheets now, um, to make sure that they are properly warning employees if there is some exposure risk with whatever material has been developed. Uh, if you're coming up with something, and maybe even whether it's in the, in the material itself, and the characteristics from the material itself initially, or when it hardens or sets or cures, when you have that material, you need to understand even some materials, once they're cured, they're not necessarily safe to be you know, rubbing around and playing with. Um, so you need to make sure that everyone who is using that product understands up front. Now, most material manufacturers should be labeling them accordingly and appropriately ahead of time. But to the extent that you're developing your own material, those are something that needs to be taken in by the institute that's actually developing the material. Can you address how the industry is dealing with um, machine to machine, batch to batch variation? So say you're a large manufacturer and you're producing thousands of devices and you, that's being done on say 10 different 
3D printing machines. And there's and the packets of materials are fairly small. So as you try to scale the volume and you due to the printing time and the machines, how do you control the variability of that space? Or can you give us some idea of what's being done? Certainly, there are software packages out there that are available. So to the extent you're doing large scale manufacturing with a particular product, you can set your controls ahead of time, such as orientation, uh, materials, and whatever, everything ahead of time. Uh, so when you're doing sort of the, just the standard manufacturing without the customization, or like maybe like Precision, who uses customized manufacturing, they can give detailed attention to something for each one because each solution is customized. When you're looking at a uniform product across the board, you can implement that, those controls in your software. And if you're not, and they're not, they, they should, or they're just setting themselves up for failure. <laughs> So, like, Thingiverse has been under a lot of speculation lately, and I, I hate to bring that one up, but it's kind of interesting because on Thingiverse, which is owned by Stratasys mm -hmm. now, they, a bunch of designers are posting designs. It's this great, good-feeling open-source software. Uh, they now, like, over 2,000 designs are actually being sold directly from Thingiverse on eBay. Oh. And so there's been, like, quite a bit of litigation, and basically, uh, the designers are not protected through Thingiverse, or it's some sort of light, loose copyright protection. Uh, and yet, the, the people selling those designs that are actually making money on eBay and getting away with it, it sounds like the lawsuits aren't going to be able to go through. So is no. Thingiverse, or would you see them locking down their terms and conditions of some sort, uh, in some sort of way uh, to make it more of a secure platform? Uh, for example, like Cult, where they actually have their terms and conditions, more protection than standard. Gina. <laughs> Gina is the IP attorney for. <laughs> yeah, I'm an IP attorney in Stratasys. I've heard that the, um, the, the lawsuits wouldn't go through. Um, the designs on Thingiverse are protected by the designers by whatever um, license they select. So um, Thingiverse has a. Um, the, um, a lot of the designers to choose. So um, to the extent that the designers have chosen um, not to put their designs in the public domain, not, um, they're not available. Um, that's all um, part of the terms on the universe. So if you, if you have a different view or a different understanding on how this is playing out, um, I'm not aware of it. Just <laughs> there, there, are, there are other implications that do come up, though. When, you're 3D, when you put up these designs up there anyways, not just from an IP perspective, but from an ITAR and an export. Uh, it's just, and, and I should say, I did mention ITAR when we talked about the 3D printing of guns. You know, just because you download, you print them, that doesn't mean you can just do anything you want with them. And then you do have concerns with, so I put up my drawing for uh, an F-18, and you can actually pull the, you know, and you, you see an F-18 ability out there. If that's downloadable by somebody in, you know, North Korea, then there might be a problem. Or if I'm uh, printing stuff and, and I decide, well, I don't want to print this here because then I'd have to export it out of the country, so I'll just send the file to my, you know, German counterpart or my... Libyan counterpart and let them print it up. Uh, you know, just because that drawing is now put over there, you're not escaping the reach of U.S. export law. Uh, that'll still come after you. And e even non-arms. So even if we just get outside of the ITAR and the arms and the munitions, you still could have ITAR is or export issues coming up into play. Just shipping something maybe to China even. Uh, so th that's something that all all of the drawings that are out there, not thinking of specific any drawing, is going to have not huge IP risks, yes, um, but export because public domain is not clearly it has not been cleared as far as the investigations go, um, and exculpating people who have downloaded and exported something. So funny enough, you might be like, what? Because you could get how to make a nuclear bomb or how to make a bomb. You can download that off the internet, and you can say it's in the public domain but you still might be in violation of several laws. And the other thing is, even if you can beat the government at this and you can go, well, ha ha, I got a public domain, the fact that you have to get indicted to get that, generally not very friendly. You know, when those, <laughs> and defense costs on those types of things, huge. If you were to get investigated by the federal government for something around ITAR or export, expect tens of thousands of dollars in, in just your attorneys. Um, and unfortunately, these don't usually make much. Yes. So you mentioned the sort of bold future of bioengineering and the prospects of you know what happens when the cost of printing organic matter, I think, falls for one average people to do it. I'm wondering if you looked into the biohacking or grinder movement at all, because 
you go to a site like biohack.me and you can find average folks right now doing all sorts of amazing and sometimes quite crazy things to their own body. Correct. It's sort of truly decentralized innovation using one's own body as the platform. Yes. And the number one, I think the number one threat is still people cutting open their fingers and putting magnets in them or something. But the number two is something involving 3D printing things to put in your skull and all sorts of other things. What do we do about that? There's no corporations there. There's no intermediaries. There's just a bunch of average folks coming together, sharing knowledge about how to use their bodies as platforms for innovation. Exactly, and that's exactly one of the huge problems that's out there right now. There are no controls around that as far as, as regulation. I mean, ultimately, the government tends to be a little bit more, it's your body, your choice, um, but th that's a fine line when you start getting into your own enhancement of your own body. What kind of enhancements can you make to yourself? Um, before you sort of crossed over that threshold. I mean, can I use uh, enhanced bones to make myself stronger? Um, and they, they do that. They can actually say, well, your bones are kind of weak. I can take this person's DNA. I can actually print you a living bone that is stronger than what you have now. I can make you faster, better, smarter. And if I could sing the song to the $6 million man, I would. Again, half of you probably don't know who he is. But um, ultimately, you can make yourself a bionic person, or you could make yourself um, Quasimodo, right, exactly. Yeah. You can make yourself a horrible train wreck if you don't know what, you, well, and odds are the average consumer might not know, and that's a huge problem. And the bigger problem you might get is not only just the average person going, oh, I think I'll print this for myself and see what I can do. Um, it's when you get this average person, and I don't want to use like a mad scientist, but what if you had a doctor who decided on his own time that he's going to come up with something and he managed to convince a patient? I mean, now you start running afoul of other, you know, you, there, there really are not boundaries as far as it relates to, to human cloning and improving and enhancements. There, there's nothing right, there, right now around that. And that's something the government really needs to address proactively. And wherever you fall on the line doesn't matter. There still should be running rules. So again, we could all play the game better. And even if we do set up the rules ahead of time, there are always going to be those people that get thrown in the penalty box. Um, but, you know, you, you kind of saw it coming, you know what I mean? At least the other people can say, that's him, not me, I'm over here. We're just going to play shorthanded until he figures out what to do. Um, so there will always be those people that try to circumvent whatever laws are there. But by the fact that they're circumventing them, you already know their intention. But that's a great point. There's nothing to stop people from playing Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the reduced cost of production, like for things such as prosthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering just how much of the reduced cost is the fact that a lot of these people are circumventing FDA regulations and not actually going through like the whole device uh, Google process, and then how you see that interplay uh, interacting moving forward. Oh, that's a great question. So the, the friend that I have, the prosthetics that she was getting for her daughter averaged $15,000 a prosthetic, and it was a prosthetic leg. Um, so her daughter's leg averaged $15,000 to print, or to buy. To print, it was $2,000. Um, now, in a case of a leg, um, probably a, a lot less concern than maybe an eye, which is actually sticking in your body. Um, I do know that the average uh, FDA to get cradle to grave um, goes in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it is a cost prohibitive and a very time consuming process. You are correct, there are people who are circumventing it. And the only way that's gonna stop is if the FDA either increases its enforcement against those entities um, or somebody sets up better rules. But enforcement's the, the hardest part of any of this. Yeah? Right, yeah, especially rats, because again, why do we need those? No, yeah, you're right, cloning is illegal. If anybody, though, figures that out with a 3D printer, call, because that's amazing. That's, <laughs> yeah, if you figure out how to clone, I got people I'll put you in contact with, and, yeah. <laughs> And I, why, why we can't figure out how to make 3D printers do dishes or, I don't know, clean my house, sweep. I don't know, that's what I need. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much.